Bless you, wonderful to have this time with you again. And I, I just want to encourage you, as always, of course. And I want to bring to you tonight how the Lord is going to be preparing you as individuals. And I want to just begin in Ephesians chapter 5. Because above everything else, and of course, you know, we're all missionaries. We're all involved in the Lord's work. We all want to see God glorified in the earth. We are the witnesses and the testimony of God in the earth. And this is the work that we're called to do. But it's also very, very important to come back to the, to the main thing for your life and mine. That is that we are the children of God. And this is more important. Because when we know we are children of God and we are with God, and we walk with God, then we will do the things that God wants us to do or asks us to do, and he will be with us. We don't do things to become children of God. We are the children of God. And because we are the children of God, we do the things that our Father asks us to do. Jesus said, I must be about my Father's business, not my business. I love the way David said, Lord, your zeal has consumed me. Because it's out of the relationship and the knowledge of who we are. Everything else comes from that. You are here because you're children of God. You're not here in the hope that you might become children of God. We need to start from where we are. And that is our life and our identity. We are children of God, born of God, by the Spirit of God. And He is our Father. We are His children. Praise the Lord. And in that we become His church. The children of God are the church of the living God. And in the earth, the church is the witness of God. It's the vehicle that God has created to be the witness into this earth, the church. And so the children of God are in the church, and God is building his church and making it glorious. Hallelujah. And this, this glorious church will be a witness and testimony in the earth. But even more than that, Jesus is coming back for his church. And so it's very important for us to, to keep our priority for our life on the fact that we are the children of God. We are men and women of God. We are sons and daughters of God. When I wake up in the morning, I don't wake up as a missionary. I wake up as a son of God. And because I'm a son of God, I do mission work. Praise the Lord. And my father and I work together to fulfill the things he needs me to do to glorify him in the earth. That the people will know, hallelujah, that he is the living God. But I'm a son of God before I'm anything else. And he's my father before he is anything else. You understand? And so for your life, it's the same. It's a big concern to me that many Christian people don't kind of have this intimacy or this sense of relationship with God. God is some one that they aspire to know, but the intimacy of relationship is not there. But the, the purpose Jesus came was that we might become the children of God and live forever with our Father. Hallelujah. Amen. Not to build a church or not to create church or, or do church things or even do mission work. Those are all a result of being children of God. The first thing, that's why the Bible teaches us like this, this is the first purpose of God, that Jesus would be the firstborn of many. Amen? And we are the many. This relationship and being children of God and growing up into men and women of God who glorify God, this is the most important part because everything else flows from there. My son David actually was just giving a, a, a communion message a little while ago, and, and he had a revelation from God because we were talking about this. And he said, this is incredible. He said, when Jesus began his ministry, the very first test that the devil brought to him, and, and it was in the wilderness, you know, the devil came to him and he said to him, if you are the son of God, do this. And he was tempting him. He was tempting his identity. If you're a man of God, then why don't you do this? And then he identified that the very last temptation of Jesus was exactly the same. On the cross, they came to him again and they said, if you are the son of God, come down. 
And so we begin to understand that the bookends of our life are that we are men and women of God. That's the, that's the security of our entire life, is that we are the children of God. And our Father is with us, and you're a man of God, and a daughter of God, a woman of God, and a man of God. We're not just people trying to live nice lives and be Christians. You understand, we are men and women of God, and when you wake up in the morning, you say, good morning, Father. This is our time, hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. And it doesn't matter what happens. It just doesn't matter what happens. We are men and women of God. And whatever happens, our God is with us and we are with our God. And we walk through our days, through our good days and our bad days. It doesn't matter. The external circumstances of our life don't change who we are. And that's so important for us. And so we come to encourage these kind of things. So this today, I just want to bring this back into your understanding again. Not that it isn't, but just to encourage it. And so we're looking at uh, Ephesians chapter 5, and I just want to read from verse 26. It's talking about Jesus and his church. And when we're talking about the church, we're talking about us. We're not talking about the other people. The church is us. And so Jesus said this, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word and that he may present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And so we can see that in, in, this, in this context, your God is raising you and me up as men and women of God to glorify him and to be perfect and without blemish, that he is creating this church which Jesus is building, that he might present it to the Father, a glorious church. And so amongst everything else that's happening in our life, something far greater is happening. That is that God is walking with us, and he is perfecting our life. He is, he is taking out the blemishes and the wrinkles. <laughs> And he's dealing with the creature that we might be perfect and glorious so that Jesus can present this church to the Father. Hallelujah. A glorious church. And it's important we keep this because sometimes we get so caught up in the things we do, we actually forget who we are. And you know and I know that there are people that are doing Christian things, but they're not their behavior and their character is not Christian character. So it's not about what we do, it's about who we are. It's way more important than that. And out of who we are, we do what we do. I am very clear, and those of you that know me will know. I do what I do because I am who I am. And you need to do what you're going to do because you are who you are. You don't have to prove yourself to anybody. You don't have to try to become anything. You are just men and women of God, hallelujah. When they asked Jesus, are you this one? He said, I am. I love that. He didn't try to explain it. He said, I am. And you need to be able to say, are you a son of God? I am. No apologies necessary. No explanation necessary. I am who I am, hallelujah. And my God is dealing with my life and he is perfecting me. And why we need to know this is because we need to be able to feel and sense this process in our life. Year by year, we should be different. We should be able to look back on a year and say, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And every one of us is a different, at a different point of maturity, if you like. Of course we are. I've been walking with the Lord for, what, 45 years or something. I should be a little bit more mature than you if you've been walking with the Lord for one year. A 45-year-old man should be more mature than a baby. Amen. And so it is with God. We walk with God. We grow up. We mature. We learn things. We grow. We make mistakes. God is with us. But we are coming to maturity. Praise the Lord. And in our individual lives, we should see that. Again, I say this, I know Christians that were, got saved when I got saved, and they're exactly the same people now than they were with the day they got saved. 
miserable people. You wouldn't want to know them then and you wouldn't want to know them now. Nothing's changed. They're still criticizing everything, judging everything, miserable. They haven't matured. They haven't grown up. There's no greater revelation of God that's come into their heart. And we all need to change, but that change comes by maturing. Amen. So that we understand the love of God and we realize who God is and who we are and, and our life grows. And the expression of our life, the maturity of our life, it grows as we walk with God. We change. And so each one of us should sense and know this change. We should be aware of it. We should be walking in it. We should be thanking God for it. Nothing's a problem. But we're all just changing. God is with us to iron out the wrinkles. Praise the Lord. Is there anything wrong with a wrinkle? Nothing wrong with a wrinkle. It just needs to be ironed out, that's all. Amen. There's no condemnation. We're all going to make mistakes. We all need wrinkling out. But there's nothing, I'm saying it like that to say, oh man, I've got this. No, it's not a problem having a wrinkle. God's got a huge iron. And at the appropriate time, he's going to deal with every wrinkle. Just walk with him and love him and appreciate it and thank him and, and just trust him to do it. And this is what I want to talk to us about tonight. Individually, we should be growing. We should feel that growth. We should be aware of the changes taking place in our life. And we should feel ourselves becoming more glorious, more mature, more able to cope more mature in the way we express our life and the circumstances of life and the knowledge and the understanding we have of God. And we should be changing in that. And so I want to talk to us just about some issues around God is wanting to perfect your life and mine. He's building his church. This is going to be a glorious church. That glory is going to touch the world and it's going to be presented to the Father. I think there's going to be, you know, I, I love seeing what God is doing in the world. And I think from my observation, and we travel a lot, we see what's going on. And you can just see and sense how God is just increasing his dynamic into the earth. It's just increasing. You know, the word of God is increasing. The heart of the Father is increasing. Why? Because this is the time. God is increasing his influence in the earth through his people. And you and I should be feeling that and sensing that as we just go about our daily life. Are you okay? You understand? I mean, you're here. You've set some time aside. This is completely perfect. But you can't leave this place the same as you came here for several reasons. Number one, you should have learned something. But number two, you've dedicated some time. It's like you're putting some superphosphate onto your life and you, and you should have felt some growth. But number three, another year has gone by and you should have grown something. Even when you're not here, another year is going to go by. Another year is going to go by. Another year. And every year we should feel that and, and, and just know that God is with us. Are you okay? We're growing. We can't stay the same because God is never the same. He's growing, 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 growing as the revelation comes. And so I'm wanting you just to catch this. God is going to be ministering to each of our lives and Ironing out the wrinkles, washing us with his word, and bringing us to a place of glory. So I want to just talk about what kind of attitude should we have for a start. And I want to just look into James chapter 1 and verse 21. In James chapter 1 and verse 21, there's a certain attitude that we need to have towards God to allow him to grow our lives, a certain attitude that we should have. And I want us to just, uh, to, to, to just consider these things. Verse 21 of James chapter 1, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness. That's repentance. We repent. We turn away from the old ways. Some of them fall away easily. Some of them slowly fall away. But we lay those things aside. We're not interested in those things anymore. But listen to this, and receive with meekness the implanted word of God. 
And so this word meekness is a very important word for us because it's, a, it's an attitude. Now, I was looking up some things to try to, to discover really what, what meekness means. We all know meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. And I've always understood meekness to be teachable. You know, we are teachable. In other words, our heart desires to learn. Humility is a little bit like meekness, uh, but to be teachable means that we have a heart that desires to learn. We don't know everything, and we want to learn. The word that comes out of it oftentimes is they talk about gentleness, and they talk about respect. And I believe it's, it's like this, that, that we don't present ourselves that I know everything. But the spirit of meekness is a spirit, it's kind of like humility, but it, it, it responds differently. And that it respects other people, it respects what they're saying, and it's willing to receive and to consider the things that someone else is saying. If a person is arrogant or unteachable, then it doesn't matter what you say. I know everything, I don't care what you have to say. Even if I'm wrong, I'm still right. And many people are like that. You can't teach them anything. Proverbs teaches us about these people. He said it's a stupid thing to try to teach a fool. You're, you're, you are now stupid. But if you teach someone who's willing to learn, that's wise. And so it's the heart that desires to learn. And you wake up, and I wake up every morning and say, Father, this is our time, hallelujah. And we're going to walk with you. And my heart is free to learn. What do you want to teach me today? Praise the Lord. And if we don't have that kind of heart, we're never going to learn anything. Amen? I told you about people I know, and I'm sure you know people. They've known them for years. They've never learned a thing. Why not? Because they think they know everything. But we don't know anything. We must come every day. Father, this is a new day. The Bible talks about new wineskin and new wine. What's a new wineskin? It's a wineskin that's ready to receive new wine. Hallelujah. It's prepared to receive something new. And the children of Israel were in the desert. They got their fresh manna every day. Hallelujah. God said, don't worry about yesterday. You, yesterday's manna is finished. This is going to rot. You can't keep it. But many people are trying to live on yesterday's manna or even their own manna. But God has got for you and me fresh manna, understanding, fresh uh, revelation, if you like, fresh knowledge and presence of God that we should enjoy every single day but if we don't have a spirit of meekness a spirit that opens its heart to learn from God then we're not going to learn anything <laughs> I mean you can come to Faith Bible College for a hundred years and you still won't learn anything you understand what I'm saying so the spirit of meekness is a fundamental attitude that we need to have I'm coming to learn Hallelujah. Of course, we're going to see our teacher is God. But we're here to learn. And people are going to speak to us. And we need to open our heart to listen. But it's God will teach us. However, if our heart is not open to learn, it doesn't matter who's teaching us. We will never learn anything. And so the spirit of meekness is very, very important. Listen to Psalm 51. And verse 17, again, this is my encouragement to you tonight, to, to have a spirit that desires to learn. You know, it doesn't matter what we believe we know, and we know a lot of good things from God, but there's more. There's a greater thing. If we tried living in the revelation that we were born again into, 40 or 50 years ago or 60 years, how many years ago if we were still trying to live in that revelation it would be death because that revelation is dead you know, it's gone God has brought a greater understanding and revelation and we need to listen I tell people, I can go to churches in different places around the world and seriously, it's like being in a time warp it's like you've just gone back 40 years they're still talking, presenting, and doing exactly the sort of things that they used to do when I was born again, back in whatever time it was. It's exactly the same. Nothing has changed. 
the way they present. I can go to places that they don't allow music. I can go to places they don't allow women to speak. And I said, well, what's the deal with them? No, that's, that's what we do. But they're caught up in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a philosophy, in a religious concept, an idea. But they've never changed. They've never allowed God to change them because they've stuck themselves. But the spirit of meekness is to be teachable. It's to be willing to learn and to move with God. And I'm saying tonight, we have to learn and move with God. We can't st stay in our place. All religion and denominations are all because people got stuck in a place. They camped there. But God moved on. But they still camped there. That's why we have all this division of understanding and ideas and philosophies among even Christianity. Different ideas, because people got stuck. But Jesus said we need to learn and move on with him. Listen to 51, and I'm going to go to verse 17. Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. And so this brokenness is, is a heart that is open to God. What's, a different, what's, what's the opposite of a broken heart? It would be a hard heart. And Hebrews teaches us, when you hear the word of God, harden not your heart as they did. What was their problem? They didn't have an open heart. They were not willing to listen to God. They had their own preconceived ideas. And so when somebody said what they believe, they go, amen. <laughs> but when someone said something they don't believe, instead of saying, Father, is this true? Is this what you're wanting to teach us? Instead of a broken heart, a heart of meekness, a contrite heart that is willing and open, it's a, it's a stubborn heart. It's a hard heart. It says, I don't believe that. I talk to people, we don't have music in our church. I said, well, why not? They said, well, we don't believe it. They said, well, why don't you believe it? The Bible is very clear that everything that has breath, praise the Lord, the harp, the trumpets, they're all there worshiping God, everything that has breath. What? We don't believe that. Well, who told you that? Well, that's our doctrine. They're hard in their heart. But God said we need to have a, our hearts are free broken heart, a contrite heart, a heart that's willing to learn and understand and receive from God. New wineskin. I love these things. Every morning we present ourselves before God. Hallelujah. Every day present yourself a living sacrifice unto God. But if our heart is hardened and we're preconceived everything about God, then that's not even a sacrifice, is it? Because you're, you're just presenting yourself. <laughs> But there is no sacrifice because you are what you are and what you perceive yourself to be. But God said, present yourself a living sacrifice unto God. Now you can hear from God. Now you can know what is the good and the perfect and the acceptable will of God. Hallelujah. So this is a freedom to come every day before God with an open heart, spirit of meekness. Let us listen to these things. I, I was just considering... Martha and Mary in Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, I was just considering these two. Luke chapter 10, we're reading verse 40 and 41. Just in the light of this fundamental attitude we need to have. Spirit of meekness, willingness to learn, openness to God. A broken and a contrite heart I will not despise. This is someone who is willing to listen and to hear from God and to make adjustments and to let the iron wrinkle them out. Look at Mary and Martha. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him, that is Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. But Jesus answered and said, Master, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. 42. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. 
And I just thought in the context of what I was sharing with you that, that Mary, it's not that Mary was lazy. And it's not that Martha was doing anything wrong in that sense. It's, it's good to serve. But Jesus was just speaking to a fundamental attitude. Listen, there's a time to serve, there's a time to sit. <laughs> and when Jesus comes, it's time to sit. <laughs> You know, it's time to open your heart and listen and receive from God. I was also contemplating when Jesus came back from when he was raised from the dead and he spent 40 days with the disciples. 40 days. That's a long time to be teaching them about the kingdom of God. Now that they were born again, they could begin to understand spiritual things. Because in the past, they couldn't do that. Oftentimes, they were just confused. But 40 days he spent with them, just now elaborating the kingdom of God, giving them spiritual revelation. Well, our hearts need to be open to that. We can't say, oh, no, that's not the way we do it. No, that's, the old, that, 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 that's, that's not the way we've always done it. We, 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 we do it like this. Jesus said, I want to show you a new way. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you today, every day, Jesus wants to show you a new way. Hallelujah. He's growing us from glory to glory. He's bringing us into this perfection, maturity. Hallelujah. That he might be glorified in our life and through our life and that we might live for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Not only that the world might see his glory through us, but that we might be glorious and ready for Jesus' return. And we need to focus on that and make sure that we are seeing these adjustments taking place in our life. I was, again, reflecting on Saul when Saul was on the horse and he met Jesus. And he said, Saul, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And again, I was just reflecting in this thing. It's, it's, it's a hard thing to fight against God. But many people fight it. Even Christian people fight and argue with God. God is trying to get through it. No, 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 fight, fight, fight. Argue, argue, contend. I don't believe that. It's a hard thing. Because you get nowhere. <laughs> if you've ever won against God, <laughs> put your hand up. <laughs> of course you, but you don't want to win against God. We have a spirit of meekness. It's a desire to learn. Father, teach me. Teach me. Teach me. Teach me. Jesus said, come learn of me. He said, I will show you things you don't know. Well, so I could say, who cares what you do know? God wants to show you something you don't know. Hallelujah. And I promise you, what he's going to teach you will far transcend what you think you do know. And in 40 years of walking with the Lord, I tell you, the greatest thrill, the greatest thrills. I mean, we walk every day with the Lord. We walk in the knowledge of God. We walk in the word of God. We walk in the revelation we have of God. That's our sustenance every day and our confidence. We are men and women of God, and we walk with God. But I tell you what, every, not every day, but every now and again, something just drops in. And that's a great day when God just shows you something you've never seen before. Hallelujah. I want to talk about that just for a moment. So how is God going to be teaching us things in our life? How is God going to be training us? We have the spirit of meekness. We have a broken and a contrite heart. We are willing to learn. We present ourselves every day before the Father. Lord, this is our time. Hallelujah. We come as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice unto God to learn of God and to be taught of God. Hallelujah. Step by step, line by line, glory to glory is raising up our lives. And again, we are telling you, 40 years, 45 years, 50 years, 60 years, it gets better and better. If you've just been walking one year, hallelujah, you're on a great journey. If you've been walking for 10, you're just getting started. Praise the Lord. It gets better and better and better and better. I am more excited about life today than I was when I began how many ever years that was ago. Why? Because God is changing us from glory to glory to glory. Look at these two. Do they look bored to you? 
They're not bored. They're more excited about God today than they ever were. Every day as I look at Carly, she's got a big grin on her face. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. We're not bored. We're excited. Jesus is coming back, and we're preparing for that time. Praise the Lord. Every one of us, no matter who we are. But this is an attitude we need to have. So I quickly want to give you. God is going to teach you by instruction. You know the scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16. Very important passage. 2 Timothy 3.16. God is going to teach you by instruction. And you're here in the Bible school and you're receiving instruction. And that's perfectly biblical. God puts teachers into the body of Christ to teach us the word of God. And so we learn the word of God from teachers. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man and the woman of God may be perfect and thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so I'm just quickly wanting to bring, teaching is a way God is going to bring instruction to your life. And that teaching can come from many different places, but God has ordained the teaching of the Word of God to, to build in to His people. Ephesians chapter 4 says that God has put into His body, Ephesians chapter 4, and we're reading verse... Eleven, And he gave to himself some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. What for? For the equipping of the church of God. Hallelujah. And so some of our instruction from God is going to come by people teaching us. And that will be in a Bible school as you have dedicated this time. And I'm saying then open your heart and listen and let God teach you and let him iron you. Let him make adjustments in your life. Don't receive instruction or teaching as a, oh yeah, well that's your idea. I'm going to show you that by revelation, God is going to reveal to you the things that you need to know but, and confirm to you what is right or wrong. But don't despise teaching. Teaching is a way God has ordained for us to learn. And we need to open our heart and open our eyes and open our ears and learn and receive from the teaching of the Word of God. But listen to 1 John 2 and 27. Because this is what I'm wanting you to catch. As you are listening to teachers and just to bring the, the understanding around this, 1 John 2 and 27, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you have not need that anyone teach you, but the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as this has taught you, you will abide in him. So what is God telling us in this passage? You don't need a teacher, no. He's telling you, I am your teacher. And I'm going to use teachers to teach you. And in their teaching, I am going to teach you. And I am going to reveal to you what you need to learn from the teacher. You understand? The spirit of truth is in you to confirm the word of truth which you are being taught. And so God is showing us that in all the teaching, he will teach us. And this is why our heart needs to be open to listen and to learn. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And so teaching the Word of God is a fundamental way that God is going to equip and train your life. Are you okay with that? And you need to open your heart and you need to listen. There's no point in coming to Bible school and coming out at the end of it. You're the same person who came in. You don't want that. You're wasting your money and you're wasting your time. Are you okay? You don't want to do that. We're here to hear from God. Hallelujah. And that will mean God is going to speak 
And that will mean we will need to make adjustments and change and get the iron out and just do these things necessary for our life. The second way we're going to learn is what I'm calling by revelation. So, 2 Corinthians. First way is just by teaching. And as you are learning the Word of God from your teachers, the Spirit of God will take what you need to hear and put it into your heart, and He will teach you the things you need to know for your life. Are you okay with that? That's how God works, teaching the Word of God. So we're here, we're here to learn. Spirit of meekness, Father, teach me. I listen. God speaks in Jesus' name. But then I talk about revelation, and this, of course, all our learning comes by revelation. But in the midst of our daily life and in our meditation and our reading of the Word of God, God also just reveals things to us. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're reading verse 17 and 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 17 and 18. Now, the Spirit, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom or liberty. Praise the Lord. We're not locked in to a system. Paul was saying in the old days they were in a system. But now there is no system. The system is the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. The veil has been torn. God has let himself free and has set us free to receive from him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom, not religion. Freedom. Freedom. What does freedom look like? Freedom looks like you walking with your God. And no one can tell you this or that or that. You are walking with your God. And he is training and equipping and revealing himself to you. We're not confined to the ideas of men. We are released into the ideas of God. Amen? Listen to verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so as you walk with your God, God will show you things. As you just go about your daily business, you are meditating in the Lord, you're talking to the Lord, and I want to show you and, and I would teach you, you must be talking with the Lord continually. Continually. The minute you wake up in the morning, good morning, Father, the conversation begins. You and your God are connected together and you're walking with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you're discussing your day. You're discussing what you're doing. He's talking with you. You're talking with him. He's showing you things. He's teaching you things. He's revealing things. He's declaring things. And in that lifestyle, bang, stuff just drops in. Oh, man. Hallelujah. And your life will be full of these divine moments where God just shows you something. And I promise you, when God shows you something, you're changed forever. I say this, you can listen to a charismatic person and he may change you for a day. You know, people listen to charismatic people and they get all excited. But they wake up tomorrow morning and they find they're just the same. But when Christ touches your heart, you are changed forever. Hallelujah. When the revelation of God comes to your heart, you are changed forever. You can never go back because God has shown you something that's just lifted your revelation from here to here. Hallelujah. I sometimes teach things in my school. People say, I've never seen that before. I said, that's right, because God showed it to me. God showed it to me. I've never seen it that way before. No, because God showed it to me, and I'm now teaching you. Praise the Lord. And your experience will be the same. In your field and in your work, God will show you things that you have never seen before. And it's likely others have never seen. Because this is something that you and your God are learning together and he's showing you things. From glory to glory, as we walk with him, he will guide you and show you things. 
praise the Lord. It's completely perfect. You know, again, and I'm just digressing back a little bit, you know, but, but you know, when we were born again, and I, f- forgive me, I'm erring on the side of a little bit hard now, but it worries me. Christians worry me. <laughs> because, you know, when you were born again, something happened, didn't it? Didn't something happen? So what changed? Why are we now doubting? Why are we now considering about God? I can never understand that. When I was born again, I was 21 years old, my life has changed forever. I had a whole life planned. But God changed the whole thing. And I just turned and kept walking. I never thought, well, what was all that about? I knew what it was all about. I had become a child of God. And I knew God is now real. I am born again. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Now I'm going to live for God. That's the revelation I received that very moment. I received Christ. I received the revelation. I need to go tell people about this. And I've dedicated my life to that. I don't get up in the morning thinking, oh, what am I doing? Oh, is God real? I don't know. Something happened. Changed me forever. We need to remember that day. Don't forget the times God spoke to your life. The things God did that no one else could do. We just forget. And we get on this doubting thing. I promise you, if God gave you 10 cents, he can also give you 10 million. It's the same God. And if he cared about 10 cents, he cares about 10 million cents. Amen? Otherwise, why did he bother with 10 cents? If God did this stupid little thing that you think, oh God, that was really cute, then God can do anything. He doesn't tease us. He doesn't dangle us on a string with a carrot. God is real. And he reveals things. He does things. He shows us things. He divinely appoints things. He, he, he divinely provides things. And if he's doing the little things, he'll also do the big things. Are you okay? God is real. Get up in the morning and thank him for a new day and trust him. Whatever you need, you'll do it. Whatever you need to know, you'll know it. Some people say, well, I never knew that before. Why didn't you show me that before? It's all stupid. God would show it before if you needed to know it before. You didn't need it till now. Right? When you need it, you have it. So thank God for every day and trust him and know it's all going to work out. Whatever you need, divine revelation, divine appointments, divine provision, divine health, divine anything, it's all yours. But you don't need it till you need it. And in between times, you need to know that God is with you and just trust him with your life and get up in the morning and be faithful. Amen. Learn, be thankful, and walk with God. And you will have all the divine appointments that you ever can handle in your life, if you don't mind me saying it like that. Our life is divine. Our life is a miracle. But don't forget, this is the thing that annoys me. Am I allowed to say I get annoyed? I get, do you forget what God did? Kind of like God blesses today and tomorrow. (laughs) What's your problem? Amen. God will show you, teach you, give you, do for you everything you need by his divine moments in your life. And if God's going to take care of this little wee thing there, he's going to take care of this great big thing over here. Amen. Whatever you need, divine. And so you're going to learn by teaching. You're going to learn by his divine revelations that he'll just drop into your heart and into your spirit as you walk with him every day. And then finally, the third way you're going to learn is by experience. 
And this one, I, I love this because this is life. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, Paul is talking to the prophet about his son. 2 Samuel chapter 7. David, I mean, did I say something else? David was talking about. Where are we? Here we are. Second Samuel chapter seven. David is talking to Samuel, I think, about Solomon, and he's saying, "Will you look after my son?" Because David knew he was about to die. In verse. 12 he said and when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers I will set up your seed after you and I will and who will come from your body I will establish his kingdom and he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever so he was assuring David that everything's going to be all right and listen to 14 and 15 and I will be his father and he shall be my son and if he commits iniquity I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. 15, but my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. So what's, what's uh, God speaking to David about? He's saying, I will be Solomon's father and he will be my son. And if he makes a mistake, I will chasten him. I will discipline him. And how will I do that? I will do that by the rod of men and by the chastening of the sons of the blows of the sons of men. What does that mean? That means if we do things wrong and we get it wrong, we're going to get a wrong result. And we need to see that that is the chastening of the Lord. That's, just, that's not the devil. God is correcting us by the circumstances of our life. I'm going to be teaching on Sunday at the living room that God's plan for your life is to, is to forgive you, heal you, restore you, bless you, and prosper you. End of story. Anything else is because we have erred. And we need to listen to that. If we're not blessed, then something's wrong. Right? Are you okay? I keep saying that tonight, don't I? Are you okay? Are you okay? It's because you're looking at me. God wants to bless. But how is he going to teach us to stay in the way? By the rod of men. By negative circumstances by things going wrong. What am I going to... Lord, by the rod of men, God will teach us. And we need to listen. Mm -hmm. It's not God's plan for us to fail. It's not God's plan for us to, to uh, get into trouble. It's not God's plan for us to, to be, and I'm going to say, to be sick, to be poor. These are not God's plans. God's plan is to prosper his people and that they be strong and healthy and, and vital and have a reason to get up in the morning. And God, God's plan for you to be depressed and, and have issues, right? The reason we have these problems is because a lot of people don't agree with that. But I can tell you, we are strong and healthy and vital and blessed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if we're not, we need to know why. We need to know why. And so when things are not going well, we need to know why. And God is going to discipline us by the circumstances of our life. The Bible says like this, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And even though he falls, God is there to pick him up again. But you have to know you've fallen 
Many people live in a state of fallenness and they think, oh, well, praise God, praise God, praise God. But there's nothing to praise God for. We praise God because things are good, not because things are bad, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. We need to know what's going on. We're not blindly walking through life, living under a curse. We're the blessed people. But if we're out of God, then smack, smack, discipline. And we need to learn that. Are you, I'll say it again, sorry. Are you okay with that? We need to listen. We need to feel. We need to, oh, God, that's not right. No, it isn't right. I better get back into the right place. I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. I learn by my mistakes. Are you going to make mistakes? Yes, you are. Have I made mistakes? Yes, I have. But I say like this, to make a mistake is not a problem, but to make the same mistake over and over again is just stupid. But many people do that. They get up and just fall over. They get up and fall over. We observe this. You'll observe it. Same people, same mistake. This year, next year, the year after that. Is that God's plan? No, it's not. What's the problem? Because we're not learning. We're not adjusting. We're not understanding. God is trying to get our attention. It's not God's plan for us to fail. It's God's plan for us to glorify him, this glorious church. It's not full of trouble. It's full of blessing. Amen? That's better than okay, okay, isn't it? Amen, amen. <laughs> and so we are learning. God is teaching us. He is training us. I, I, I want to take you to one more scripture. Psalm 119. Listen to this. Psalm 119, and I'll close here just to summarize everything. Psalm 119. And I'm reading from verse 67. Listen to these words. I'm talking about the ways God is going to train your life. Why is God going to train you? Because he's having a glorious church. And he wants to glorify himself in your life and that the world might know that he is perfect, but he's also perfecting us for the return of Jesus. We are the children of God. He's going to teach us by teaching. Just teaching. He's ordained teachers to teach. We need to listen. And the Holy Spirit will convict down, con con confirm to our heart the things that we need to be learning. He's going to teach us by revelation. As we just go through our daily life and we walk with God, he will drop things in. And these will be life-changing moments for us. But he's also going to teach us by correction. I'm not going to read it, but Hebrews tells us clearly that he whom he loves, he chastens. Amen. And no chastening for a sea is good. No one enjoys the chastening. But the fruit of it is perfect. But we have to know we're being chastened. We're not just having a bad run. It's not the devil. We don't belong to the devil anymore. We belong to God. But how does God get our attention when we're doing stupid things? Circumstances. If things are not going right for me, I'm thinking, Lord, what happened? What's going on here? What are you trying to show me? Can be the devil. Well, we need to know. It's no good rebuking the devil when it's your own fault. You understand? Before verse 67, Psalm 119, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. <laughs> you are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grief, but I delight in your law. Listen to 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. 72, the law of your mouth is better for me than thousands of coins of gold or silver. So here the psalmist is acknowledging it was a good thing. When I was afflicted, God corrected me. Now I know your word is there for me and it's right. Praise the Lord. And so I'm just bringing you into this thing. Among everything else that we're doing, something way more important is happening. 
God is preparing you for the return of Jesus. And that looks like perfecting you. That looks like, glor that looks like glorifying his name in your life, which means we're changing. We're coming to maturity. We're adjusting ourselves. We're responding to the teaching, to the training, to the admonition of the Lord, to the correction of the Lord. We have a broken heart and a contrite heart. We are willing to learn. The spirit of meekness is in our life. We are not people who know everything. We are, we, are the, we, we are the meek of the earth. We are here to listen to God and to understand what he's trying to say so that we can grasp him. Hallelujah. And so this kind of attitude I'm encouraging us tonight just to capture, just to come before your God every day. Father, I open my heart to you. Teach me what I need to know. Show me your ways, Father, that I might grow into them. And for each of us at different levels of understanding, this is growing from glory to glory. And as you walk with your God, he will drop things into your heart. And when we make a mistake, we make a mistake. Take your correction, face it, and make the adjustment and continue to walk with God in Jesus' name. We are the children of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Thank you for letting me.